guess we'll get started. So, topic is surgical treatment of ocular surface disorders. Um, so we're, we're talking about the ocular surface. It's not just the cornea. We're also including the lids and tarsal conjunctiva as well as the uh, bulbar conjunctiva. And these are kind of the surgical procedures I'm going to go over. Basically anything to do with the ocular surface I'll try and mention. Um, so conjunctival biopsy, so obviously for biopsying anything, any sort of conjunctival tumor, um, anything that's suspected to be CIN um, or pigmented lesions, um, conjunctival biopsies are also helpful in diagnosing um, ocular cicatricial pemphigoids. So you see linear staining of um, IgG against the basement membrane in OCP. Um, so basically my techniques for biopsy are uh, marking the borders if it's not obvious. So if it's, tip, you know, typically if it's not a pigmented lesion, I'll mark the borders because I'm going to inject lidocaine underneath uh, the conjunctiva and that'll kind of obscure the margins of the lesion. Um, with uh, anything that's suspected to be conjunctival melanoma, um, it's recommended that a very wide margin is used. Um, the shields recommend a four millimeter. Uh, margin, which is quite large. Um, sometimes if it's not possible, then you can go a little smaller than that. Um, and they um, kind of advocate what's called a no-touch technique, basically not touching the actual lesion if you're suspecting melanoma. Um, and then I recommend cryotherapy of the cut conjunctival edge if there's any sort of suspicious, suspicious lesion, whether it be cancer or even like a CIN. Um, and I use, employ the double freeze-thaw technique. So I'll show a little video. So I basically take the cryoprobe and go just on the conj edge. I'm not cryoing the sclera. Um, this is the one, this is, there's one cryoprobe that like freezes in between when the, when you're not pushing the pet pedal down. So watch for that. Um, and I basically just very lightly, barely get it to freeze. And then I take my foot off the pedal and get it to thaw. And I have like basically kind of overlapping spots across the conj edge. So basically until you see that ice ball and then I kind of take the foot off the pedal. And so you get the idea. So I kind of march across. And then once I, I hit all the spots, um, I'll go back and do it again. So double freeze thought just to make sure you don't miss any um, spots along the conjunctiva. And this is to prevent any sort of recurrence. If there's any sort of um, neoplastic cells um, along that cut conjunctival edge. Uh, next, talking about tarsorophy. So uh, for really any sort of um, non-healing cornea epithelial defects that are recalcitrant to other treatments. So one may be surprised even if someone's been on bandage contact lenses for a while, not healing. Once they get a tarsorophy, they can heal really quickly. So it's something about um, just the patient's own tissue against um, their epithelial defect that can get them to heal. Um, so consider it with lagophthalmos. Um, you can make the tarsorophy temporary or permanent. Um, you can make it medial, you can make it central, you can make it temporal, depending on whether or not you want any sort of opening for the patient. Typically, I'll put the tarsorophy in a temporal position um, just so they can still see a little bit and they can get their eye drops in. Um, and there's different ways to do a tarsorophy. The most common is going to be with a suture. Um, this can be temporary or permanent. And with a permanent tarsorophy, you uh, kind of debris off or cut off the um, just the a thin strip of the an epithelium off the eyelid margin, so you can get the eyelid margins to fuse permanently. Um, other sorts of tarsorophies, there's glue tarsorophy, or basically take like cyanoacrylate glue and like glue their eyelashes together. It's not great, um, but I suppose if you've got someone who can't undergo a suture tarsorophy for whatever reason, it's a nice temporary fix. Um, Botox tar tarsorophy is injected into the actual levator muscle to cause ptosis. Um, and it's nice because then their eyelids aren't actually, you know, fused or sutured together. So you can actually manually open up the eyelid really easily for um, examination. But obviously with Botox, it lasts about three months. So um, it's going to be for people who need a little more long-term effect, but maybe not permanent. 
Um, next, pterygium excision. So this is kind of a um, subset of conjunctival biopsies. Um, so my indications for excising a pterygium is, um, you know, the most obvious is going to be any sort of pterygium that's heading towards the visual axis or in the visual axis. Um, sometimes you can have a pterygium that looks fairly small, but it's causing um, distorted vision because it can induce significant astigmatism. Um, or other times there may be a pterygium that doesn't meet the above two criteria, but there is persistent discomfort or redness or inflammation that's not relieved by topical drops. Um, so here's an example of a pterygium. Um, you can see here, and it's inducing flattening in the area um, that the pterygium is in on topography. So this may be visually significant. Um, with excision, it's important to remove the underlying tenons layer um, to prevent recurrence. And when you remove the underlying tenons layer, the actual defect on the conjunctiva, after you remove the uh, pterygium, it actually kind of gets bigger because it relaxes. Um, you want to send the specimen to path to rule out any sort of dysplasia or neoplastic lesions. Sometimes you get surprised. Um, as far as what to do after the pterygium is off, they used to do, people used to do bare square. I mean, they just took the pterygium off and that was it. There was a very high recurrence rate. It was about 50% recurrence um, with this technique. Um, one could consider primary closure of the conjunctivo, um, the suture. Um, I might only consider this with a really small pterygium, really small conjunctival defect, but I typically will not be um, doing this for a pterygium. Um, these are the two most common techniques that are done to prevent recurrence. Um, conjunctival autograft, which you could maybe term conjunctival transplantation of the patient's own conjunctiva, or suturing or gluing down amniotic membrane. Um, so conjunctival autograft has the lowest rate of recurrence. Um, it's been reported about 2 to 5 percent recurrence of um, pterygia after conjunctival autograft, and you basically um, take a free conjunctival graft from the superior bulbar conjunctiva. Um, you then leave that superior conjunctival defect open. Um, and then you take that graft and apply fibrin grue and or suture to the area where the pterygium was excised. And it's important to seal the graft to the cut conjunctival edge, um, again, to prevent recurrence. Uh, amniotic membrane is useful if the superior conjunctiva is not available for a graft, um, such as scarring, if there's a TRAB, um, or maybe a patient with significant glaucoma who might be getting a TRAB, you, know, you probably might consider doing amniotic membrane. Um, sometimes you get a double-headed pterygium, a nasal and a temporal one, so then I'll use a conjunctival autograft on one of the pterygium and an um, amniotic membrane not for the other. Um, and again, you, you can apply it with fibrin glue or sutures. Um, mitomycin C, I will use um, intraoperatively if it's a recurrent pterygium that's being removed, um, and this is to prevent further recurrence. Um, so what I do is I soak sponges with mitomycin C and then tuck it underneath the conjunctival edge, um, wait two minutes, take out the sponges, and then do a really copious rinse. Um, there is a concern for complications months to maybe even years later with scleral melts and infectious scleritis, so this is why I don't use mitomycin in all cases of um, pterygium excisions. Dr. Yeah. When you use the, what, what's your indication for using the fibrin glue versus the suturing? Um, so I do both. So i <coughs> so I used to do suturing when fibrin <coughs> glue didn't exist, and it takes forever. Um, so then fibrin glue is really, really easy. Um, but then for building purposes, I think you need to um, show that you sutured something. So I'll usually put two sutures, like two vicryl sutures at the limbus, okay. and then um, use to seal for the rest, fibrin glue. Yeah. Um, next I'm going to talk um, a little bit more extensively on limbal stem cell deficiencies and limbal stem cell transplants. Um, so limbal stem cell deficiencies may be partial or they can be complete. And you'll see conjunctivalization of the cornea, um, a thickened, vascularized, irregular surface. There may be chronic inflammation, persistent epithelial defects, stromal ulceration, um, corneal scarring, and in um, some cases there could actually be corneal perforation with um, non-healing um, epi defects. Um, so here's an example, a good example of limbal stem cell deficiency of pretty much almost all of the limbus. There might be a little quadrant of relatively healthy limbus here, but this is all vascular. As you can see, the blood vessels growing in, and there's corneal scarring. Um, here's an even more extreme example with um, very prominent um, 
neovascularization and conjunctivalization. You might see a little thinning of the cornea centrally. Um, this is an example of stromal ulceration. So you've got 360 degrees of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency, but then this is a non-healing epithelial defect. Um, so with limbal stem cells, so these cells are defined by the capacity for unlimited or prolonged self-renewal to produce at least one type of highly differentiated progeny. And it's defined by their niche, which is kind of like their environment or their place. Um, and the stem, the, it depends on the contact with the surrounding cells, um, extracellular matrix interactions, and local growth factors. Um, this is a major target of gene therapies. Um, and limbal stem cells are different than embryonic um, stem cells. But basically, you've got the limbus separating the conjunctiva and the cornea, and somewhere in the limbus, you've got these corneal or limbal stem cells that cause uh, kind of corneal differentiation and protects. Um, it basically is a barrier for preventing the conjunctiva from growing onto the cornea. Um, this slide, I'm basically just showing that um, this is a path slide basically highlighting goblet cells um, taken from a biopsy of conjunctiva that's kind of grown onto the uh, cornea. So it does show that there is indeed conjunctivalization um, of the cornea. Um, there are basically six types of limbal stem cell deficiencies. It can be congenital, traumatic, iatrogenic, autoimmune, neoplastic, or idiopathic. Um, congenital, the most common category is going to be aniridia. So aniridia, I mean, with the name, you think no iris, but um, in actuality, they usually have some sort of iris, but um, also with that is um, pretty severe limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, other congenital um, conditions are ectodermal dysplasia, um, kid syndrome, keratitis ichthyosis, deafness syndrome, and keratitis associated with multiple um, endocrine deficiencies. So these are going to be more rare. Um, traumatic um, is also very common. Um, chemical and thermal injuries, um, contact lenses can actually induce limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, if there's any sort of inflammation or infection um, that extends to the limbus, that could destroy limbal stem cells. Um, it's also associated with neurotrophic keratopathy and chronic bolus keratopathy. Um, the prognosis of a chemical injury depends on the extent of the ocular surface involved and the amount of limbal ischemia that is seen acutely. Um, and there is a classification scheme for this called the Roper Hall classification, um, which basically grades um, limbal ischemia and kind of comes up with a prognosis. So you can see if there's a lot of limbal ischemia, there's a poor prognosis. Um, and usually the cornea is very opaque, um, and it's hard to see iris underneath. Um, so here is an example of acid burn. Um, I wouldn't, there might be just a little bit of limbal ischemia, but it's not too bad because you can, actually can see some pinkness and some vessels. So if you see pink or if you see red, that's actually a good thing. That's a good prognosis. Um, so this, if you kind of look back at this classification, I probably categorize it as a little grade two um, less than a third limbal ischemia, so still a good prognosis. Um, and there, there is some haziness as seen in this picture here. Um, here is an example of um, a chronic non-healing corneal ulcer post-alkali burn. Um, really not seeing um, limbal ischemia here, so this is also a good prognosis overall. Um, here's an example of an alkali burn with ischemia seen acutely, so this is a pretty large area, so this is very, very white. This is not good. This is classic limbal ischemia. And then subacutely, this space just never really fills in with um, blood vessels. So everything else is fine out here. You see blood vessels kind of growing in here, but there's really nothing here. So this will pretend a poor prognosis. Um, this is an example of um, kind of more extensive limbal ischemia where you see you know, limbal ischemia going all the way around, and you can see that the cornea is very cloudy. And again, poor prognosis. Um, you can get limbal stem cell deficiency from iatrogenic causes, such as multiple um, limbal surgeries or cryotherapies to the limbus. Uh, Long-term topical medications, preservative, can actually cause limbal stem cell um, deficiency. Um, if there's any sort of anti-metabolite use, such as 5-FU or mitomycin, either uh, intraoperatively or um, in topical form. Um, and also radiation can induce limbal stem cell deficiency. 
Um, autoimmune causes are, um, will include SJS and TEN syndrome, um, oculus secretorial pemphigoid, um, any sort of chronic lumbitis um, from atopic disease, vernal disease, or flectennial disease, um, and also peripheral ulcerative keratitis, including Morin's ulcer. Um, neoplastic, I put pterygium on here, technically could be considered neoplastic even though it's benign, um, and also CIN and something like a squamous cell carcinoma, um, and lastly, idiopathic. So transplant, there's actually certain um, transplantation classifications um, that are done. So if you have a limbal stem cell deficiency and you want to do a limbal stem cell <coughs> transplant, it can be an autograft, meaning from a uh, patient's own tissue. So this could be harvested from the same or fellow eye. Usually it'd be from the fellow eye that is not affected. Um, or it can be an allograft, um, which is harvested from um, cadaveric tissue or from living related um, tissue and usually kind of more HLA matched. Um, and these are some of the abbreviations. There's lots of abbreviations used here um, in relations to limbal stem cell transplants. So conjunctival limbal autograft. So this is from the patient's fellow eye. Um, there's living related um, allograft from a living relative. Most common one that we'll see is a KLAL, keratolimbal limbal allograft. This is from cadaveric tissue. Um, these last two are not really used in the United States because these involve um, Ex, um, expanding limbal tissue outside of the eye and then putting it back in the eye, um, but I will mention that later. Um, so this is basically what we're doing. So the recipient has their limbus and kind of fibrovascular tissue removed. Um, there is donor um, kind of peripheral corneal limbus um, that's harvested and that is sutured onto the recipient. Um, so conjunctal limbal autograft, so again, from patient's own tissue. So this is indicated in unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency um, and could be from chemical or thermal injuries, from pterygium, um, the source, again, same eye or unaffected fellow eye. Up to six clock hours of the donor tissue can be safely harvested without risk to the healthy fellow eye. Um, and the nice thing about this type of procedure is because it's the same, if it's the patient's own tissue, there's not going to be any risk of graft rejection and the patient doesn't need any systemic immunosuppression. Um, living related um, allografts um, indicate in bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, the source is a living related donor with an optimal HLA match. Um, and obviously the donor can't really have any other sort of risk factors for limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, because it's not the patient's own tissue, systemic immunosuppression is still required. Um, but because it's a living related donor, it um, kind of improves the prognosis for any future um, transplant, corneal transplant that's done down the line. Um, so this is what's done. So this is the uh, donor being harvested, patient also kind of has the um, peripheral cornea and a bit of scleral um, taken off as well as the uh, fibrovascular tissue over the cornea and then the donor tissue is kind of sutured at 12 and 6 o'clock. Um, so here's an, an example of donor tissue being harvested here. Um, Keratolimbal allograft or KLAL, so this is from cadaveric um, limbal stem cells. Um, the peripheral cornea is the carrier for the limbal stem cells. Um, systemic immunosuppression is required, um, and this may eliminate or delay the need for a PK. Um, so doing, if there's a lot of corneal neovascularization and there's a concern for extensive limbal stem cell deficiency, um, doing a limbal stem cell transplant prior to a corneal transplant can improve the prognosis of that corneal transplant by about 80%. Um, so limbal stem cell transplants allow for healing of persistent epithelial defects, ocular surface stability, and regression of neovascularization, and then the chronic inflammation um, that is seen uh, does subside. Um, so here's the technique. So first, um, the recipient conjunctiva is marked off with cautery, and this is going to be the border for what is removed. So it's a couple, it's a couple millimeters back from the limbus. Um, and then the uh, va fibrovascular panis is removed along with that um, peripheral skirt of uh, conjunctiva in here. Um, and then once everything is exposed, looks like this. Um, 
And then the donor cornea is punched in the middle, usually about seven or seven and a half millimeters in the middle. Um, so you got a donut. And then this tissue is um, split. And then the anterior part of that split is sutured. Um, so here's another diagram. So seven and a half millimeter in the center and then about at least a millimeter of scleral tissue. And you actually need, um, you actually need three halves just because kind of when you manipulate things, there's not quite enough tissue if you just have two halves. So you need a little bit more of, from another eye. So you actually need two globes. Um, and then when, you, when this split thickness is done, we take kind of usually split it two thirds, one third, and then this anterior one third is, is what gets sutured. You don't want to suture this whole um, bit of thickness because then it's way too bulky. So that's the reason for um, debulking. And then the limbal stem cells are going to be in this anterior one third anyway. Um, and so then you can see kind of these three halves um, just to fit in the three pieces all around the patient's cornea and then this is sutured down with 10 nylon. And this is showing a piece of tissue. I think this is not acutely post-op. Uh, this is acutely post-op, so it's pretty red. Um, and I think in this case, amniotic membrane was put over the whole thing as well. Um, so all these pieces are, are sutured down and then amniotic membrane on top. Um, so that's the um, KLAL technique. Um, I'm just going to put up a brief slide on this new technique for limbal stem cell transplant that's been talked about called SLET, uh, Simple Limbal Epithelial Transplantation. Um, I think this was talked about in the Grand Rounds last year, but basically, instead of doing that whole KLAL procedure, um, the patient's um, um, kind of corneal epithelium and fibrovascular tissue is removed, and then you basically take um, small pieces of limbal tissue, either from the patient's fellow eye or donor tissue, um, kind of cut them up into very small pieces, put them on the cornea. Um, but before that, you sandwich it between two layers of amniotic membrane. So you lay down amniotic membrane on the patient, um, then use fibrin glue to glue down these little pieces of limbal tissue kind of in the periphery, and then glue down or suture another piece of amniotic membrane on top. Um, so this, I think long term, it hasn't really been studied too much. Um, I have a feeling this may work for maybe partial limbal stem cell uh, deficiency, maybe not for complete. Um, but that remains to be seen. Um, okay, this is another, so the last kind of uh, category of uh, limbal stem cell transplants I'm going to talk about is um, ones involving um, ex vivo stem cell expansion. So either taking the patient's own healthy limbus from a fellow eye and growing that in a lab on a sheet of amniotic membrane and then transplanting it back in or taking um, limbal stem cells from a cadaveric donor and growing that on a sheet of amniotic membrane. Um, so we don't do this in the United States, but I think it's being done in Japan and maybe some other places um, in Asia. And if the patient's own tissue being used, then no systemic immunosuppression is required. Um, so then donor tissue is taken, it's grown onto um, piece, a sheet of amniotic membrane and then sutured onto the Recipient. And then this is showing um, after they expand the uh, limbal epithelium on the amniotic membrane for three weeks, um, this number one is showing the limbal stem cells kind of on top of um, denuded, this is denuded amniotic membrane epithelium, and then this is the actual amniotic membrane, like the stroma. So it's showing that the um, human limbal stem cells are actually growing on top of amniotic membrane. So that's kind of cool. Um, Post-operative management, just overall for limbal stem cell transplants, um, topical medications with steroids and cyclosporin, um, maximize um, lubrication, <coughs> occlusion. You might consider torsorophy to help with healing. Um, this can be permanent or, or temporary. Um, there may be a subsequent PK needed. And then systemic immunosuppression is usually needed for about 12 to 18 months, um, maybe longer for younger patients. Um, and these are some of the agents that are being used, um, systemic steroids, 
cyclosporin or tacrolimus and azathioprine or um, mycophenolate. Um, next is um, keratoprosthesis, which is also used for limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, it's kind of a surgery of last resort. Usually it's in a patient who's had multiple um, uh, PK graft rejections, and maybe they've even had a limbal stem cell transplant already. Uh, the problem with keratoprostheses is that um, there's resulting glaucoma, which can be very hard to control. They often need a tube, um, and they're at very high risk for infection as well. Um, and this is basically what it is. Um, it's got a front optic um, that patients look through, and that gets threaded through a uh, corneal graft that's been punched out in the middle. And there's a back plate. This is the older um, version of the K-Pro, which had a PMMA back plate with a locking ring. Um, but there's a newer version that has their back plate made of titanium, and there's not a locking ring. Um, so here's some pictures. So this is of the older um, type of Boston keratoprosthesis. So it's got PMMA in the back, so you can't really see the back plate as well. You can see those little kind of holes here that are put there kind of just to make sure there's enough nutrition that can kind of transport in between. And then this is the newer titanium version, um, which is a lot more apparent because it is made of titanium. But it's got the same kind of type of holes in there. Um, switching gears to conjunctival flaps. So this is surgery that's done for um, things like a chronic sterile ulcer, um, painful bullae um, with poor visual potential. Um, might consider it for an unstable corneal wound such as progressive thinning. Um, I don't really recommend it for active infection, although some people have done it with success or if there's a corneal perforation. Um, can be a partial conjunctival flap, meaning covering part of the cornea or a complete flap, which is termed a Gunderson flap. Um, you do need to remove the patient's corneal epithelium so that the conjunctiva can stick on top. Um, so this is diagram of the Gunderson flap. So um, a superior conjunctival incision is made pretty far superiorly. Um, you kind of dissect down. You got to do a 360 degree pyridomy. And then you take the superior kind of large flap and bring it down to cover the whole cornea. And the cornea needs to be denuded of epithelium and then um, kind of sew that down and then that stays permanently. So as you can tell, it's going to impact um, vision. So I typically will, will reserve this for patients with very low visual potential who need a contra. Um, mucous membrane grafting, um, this is for reconstruction of conjunctival mucosa in inactive cicatricial conjunctival disease from inactive SJS or um, OCP um, that's maybe not so late stage. And you can achieve better ocular surface lubrication by improving the tear film distribution and eyelid movement. Um, <coughs> buccal mucosa is usually used, so this is something that has to be combined with oculoplastics. Um, this does not replace limbal stem cells, however. Um, next, um, just want to briefly touch on amniotic membrane transplant for severe Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and this is kind of the email I'd sent out last week regarding um, the protocol. So basically anyone with severe or extremely severe S uh, acute SJS will need an urgent amniotic membrane transplant. So the definition of severe is basically um, staining over at least a third of the lid margin on at least one lid. Um, any corneal epithelial defect that's more than punctate staining, um, if there's um, bulbar, bulbar or papebral conjunctival staining greater than one um, centimeter, then urgent amniotic membrane is um, advised. And um, that's kind of the paper it was taken from. And it's usually better to do this sooner rather than later. So if it could be done within a week of the patient's um, eye symptoms, um, better prognosis there is. And the purpose for doing amniotic mem a total amniotic membrane transplantation is to prevent um, kind of chronic scarring and inflammation that can occur with chronic SJS. Um, there's various methods for um, putting on the amniotic membrane. This is the method we've been doing kind of more recently. So you take um, a large, the largest size you can get of amniotic membrane, which is five by five centimeters, and this is um, cryopreserved amniotic membrane. Take that square piece, split it in half, um, then trim the patient's, all the lashes, 
and suture an edge of the amniotic membrane just anterior to the lash line with a running 8 nylon. Um, then you tuck the um, amniotic membrane kind of over the lashes and tuck it into the fornices, um, and then take 6-O-proline and go through the eyelids and suture to bolsters. Um, these are kind of some foam bolster bolsters that I've used. I think here we've been using like IV tubing and using that those as bolsters. Um, and then after that's done to all four um, lids, then a Procara is placed. And this is, a pro so a Procara is amniotic membrane that's attached to a um, kind of a plastic ring, um, and that gets put in. And then the amniotic membrane takes about a week or two to fully dissolve. And after it's dissolved, um, the proline can be removed, the 8 nylon can be removed, the Procara residual ring can be removed, and then the patient's reassessed to see whether or not they need a repeat transplant. So if there's um, still epithelial defects, if there's still a lot of inflammation, um, then a repeat transplant might be indicated. But usually people do well with just one. Um, next, talking about superficial keratectomy. So this is a procedure where there's removal of the corneal epithelium. It might, may or may not include Bowman's. Um, there's no replacement tissue that is placed. So the indications are going to be removal of any sort of super, superficial tissue. Um, technically, peeling off a pterygium off the cornea would be considered a superficial keratectomy. Um, or peeling off a Salzman nodule, which usually sits on top of Bowman's um, membrane. Um, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, so basically if you're taking off the um, corneal epithelium. Um, you might consider it for very superficial scarring, but this would only be involving kind of epithelium. Um, sometimes you get um, suspected corneal CIM, which is like kind of a gray-white sheet growing over the cornea. So if you suspect CIM, that epithelium needs to be sent to path. Um, taking out a, re a retained superficial foreign body could be considered a superficial keratectomy. Um, and there's a couple um, types. There's manual, which is the most common type, so either scraping the epithelium off with the blade or peeling something off with forceps, whether it be a pterygium or Salzman nodule, um, and also diamond burr polishing of underlying Bowman's um, layer is considered part of superficial keratectomy. Um, PTK is also maybe considered a subtype of superficial keratectomy. Um, so this is using the eczema laser, same laser we use with PRK and LASIK, to ablate tissue um, as a form of keratectomy. Um, the Visix laser, which is made by AMO, has an actual PTK setting where you can set like a big, broad beam, um, and you kind of program how many pulses you want that um, big, broad beam to go. Um, here at Moran, we don't have the physics, but we've got the, um, the Alcon Wavelight um, EX500 laser. So it can't give a full broad beams, but what we do is we basically program it for PRK. So we're basically doing PRK, but doing it for the purpose of removing um, anterior stromal irregularities. So what kinds of problems um, can you treat? Um, you can treat granular dystrophy um, by just kind of smoothing out some of the anterior, those anterior crumbs. Um, it's been done with in post LASIK striae, and we're, we're talking like striae that have been there for a while. Acutely, if they're striae, you want to relift the flap and kind of um, take off the epithelium, get it to smooth out. But let's say you've got striae that are chronic, could consider PTK to remove it. Um, you can use it in certain scars. It's not good for anything deeper than 100 microns in depth. Um, it may not work as well in post herpetic scars or traumatic scars. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you.